We get all sorts on Halloween night. I suppose that's the way of things at any bar, but this wasn't always the most popular in town. I'd been bartending for a good decade or so, but just moved out to this small town a few years back. Having been brought up and spent most of my adult life in the big city, I'd seen more than my fair share of crazy shit. Everything from people getting stabbed in brawls that got out of hand to very tipsy college kids streaking through the door running circles around the damn place and back out into the night. One Saturday night, the angry husband of one of our regulars, one who was enjoying the company of someone not her husband, came in, firing off a gun in the damn place, not even aiming at his cheating wife, and landing a bullet in my shoulder in the process. After getting out of the hospital and enduring a few months of physical therapy, I sort of lost my taste for big city life. Not only that, but with my shoulder and left arm having a bit less endurance than they used to, along with a good deal of stiffness, I couldn't exactly keep up with the busy crowds at the bar. I had nothing holding me in the city anymore. A series of ex-lovers, an overpriced apartment, and no living family members. So I packed my shit, jumped in my truck, and headed out in search of greener pastures. The college town I ended up in is a fraction of the size of where I was born, which is a good and a bad thing. Even the most bustling bar on these parts doesn't get especially slammed, even on the weekends. This one, a little hole in the wall, called the house that Jake built, does well enough, but it's not always the greatest for earning me a bit of extra scratch. As unpredictable as the people could be in the city, I could clean up a good four to five hundred bucks worth of tips over the weekend alone. Here, I was lucky if I made half of that over the entire week. My paycheck is a bit fatter than what I made back in the city, likely to compensate for the much fewer tipping customers. It has its moments, I suppose. Back home, the bar would stay busy, but always more so during the holidays. Christmas, of course, had a far more melancholy crowd, getting hammered in an effort to battle those seasonal ghosts. Halloween was much more of a party night, with people in costumes coming in and out, laughing and having a great time. It was nice, but it could get obnoxious quickly. October 31st in this town, as it turned out, brought a very similar sort of traffic into this far more humble tavern. Mostly kids from the local college trying to steer clear of the much more bustling group at the more popular bar just a few blocks away. Sure, we'd have the occasional far too drunk for their own good characters we'd have to kick to the curb, but it was often a fun crowd, especially during these times. That's the way it was last year. I found myself chuckling at some of the more outlandish costumes while having to turn away some kids who hadn't put the slightest bit of effort into their fake IDs. I suppose that happens a lot in a college town. As the hours progressed, my body growing more tuckered out by the moment, and my shoulder throbbing like a son of a bitch, I kept glancing up to the clock mounted on the wall, begging it to hasten itself closer to 1am. That was another thing I did love about living here. The earlier end of the workday. At the old place, I'd be lucky to be heading home by four, but Jake, the owner of the joint, would insist that everyone was gone by one, allowing me to bail as soon as the nightly cleanup was done. Around nine that night, when blue lights of several police cars illuminated the world beyond our door, something that's quite rare in this small slice of America, just about every head turned to see where they were headed. A few of the more loudmouth college boys ran out to the parking lot, cheering the cops on, inspiring the friends still inside to erupt with laughter. I couldn't help but to chuckle myself, my mind flashing back to the couple of years I attended university before dropping out. I hated to return to my folks' house, as my home life had always been a bit of a train wreck, but it couldn't be helped. My high school grades hadn't been the best, so I had no luck getting a scholarship, and God knows my folks wouldn't fork out a cent to help me. If anything, they kept milking every penny they could for me, making it impossible to afford my tuition. I went from having a blast while making halfway decent grades in between partying to moving back to my old bedroom and paying my deadbeat parents' mortgage and anything else they could squeeze out of me. I feel like an asshole for saying it, but them both passing away within a month of each other might have been the best thing that ever happened to me, and I not felt so guilty about it. Sure, I, I mourned for them, even with all the shit they put me through since I was a kid, but even with the stress their passing relieved me of, I could never forgive myself for it. Anyway, so maybe 15 or 20 minutes after the cops sped by and the crowd returned to its otherwise distracted state, one more customer came strolling in through the door. While everyone else in the bar was in one costume or another, me and my boss included, this guy looked like his was an afterthought at best. 
Jake and I had been critiquing the costumes most of the night, more to entertain ourselves than anything. Sure, my makeshift mummy costume with my buttoned vest over the top of the tattered bandages wasn't the most inspired festive garb, nor was Jake's classic Dracula outfit with a cape and all, but we weren't judging ourselves. Most of the college kids were dressed in cheap department store costumes with the Velcro strips holding them in place, while the girls primarily wore the traditional skimpy fairy tale dresses. Slutty Cinderella, Easy Tinkerbell, and Check Out My Jugs Ariel, just to name a few. Of course, regardless of how chilly they had to be this time of year, me and Jake weren't going to downgrade their rankings based on unoriginality. We did drop a few points off the guy in the hot dog costume, after several too many wiener jokes, rolling our eyes regardless of how perpetually horny we were at that age too. While I couldn't deny that the fake blood splashed across the white t-shirt and torn blue jeans of the new patron, it looked real enough, as did the matching stains across his bare forearms and face. I can help but let out a sigh at his lack of effort, though. Halloween having always been one of my favorite times of year, I did tend to be a little more dramatically judgmental about less than inspired costumes. Hell, I'd almost rather someone not even get dressed up at all rather than cheapen out on it. When he sat down at the bar with a defeated and depressed look on his face, I was almost hesitant to approach him. Don't get me wrong, I, I mean, as a bartender, I'm fairly used to the countertop therapy most melancholy customers expect from time to time, but I just wasn't feeling it at the moment. The hour was late, my feet were throbbing, and my head was beginning to pound from the unusually loud crowd. All I wanted was to get the hell out of here, kick back in my bed, and catch the final hours of the late-night horror movie marathon before passing out for the night. Oh, what's it gonna be, champ? I asked plastering my best attempt at an inviting smile on my face. Five shots of your strongest tequila, he said in a monotone voice, not so much as glancing up from his stare down with his fidgeting fingers. I'm gonna need to see your ID first. At first glance, he looked to be in his early to mid-twenties, but it's always better to be certain in a town like this, especially with my boss lingering. Reaching to his back pocket, letting out a sigh and patting down every other pocket of his pants, he just shook his head, still avoiding eye contact. I gave a glance to Jake, who was sitting in the corner behind the counter, with a what-do-you-think expression. He just shrugged with a slight tilt of the head, an expression that I knew to mean, fuck it. You got cash on you, kid? I asked, hoping to be able to throw him a bone. He glanced up, finally meeting my gaze with his dark eyes. As he slipped a hundred dollar bill from his pocket, slapping it on the counter, he gave me a grateful smirk. Thanks, man he said, strangely exhausted look on his face. He knocked back each of the shots as soon as I slid them towards him, not even wincing from the burn. He asked for the strongest we had, which is far from the smoothest, something that damn near caused me to gag each time I sampled it over the years. Now, I'm not one of those guys who likes to essentially dick measure how much I can drink, but I do have quite the high tolerance. I would generally feel confident in saying I could easily drink any of our regular customers under the table without breaking a sweat. That being said, this skinny kid sloshing back five shots of this nasty-ass shit as though he just chugged some Kool-Aid left me almost intimidated. You got anything stronger? He asked with another sigh. <laughs> you might want to let that digest for a sec, I said with a chuckle, honestly quite curious to see how far he could take this. Nah, he said. The faster I get fucked up, the better. Your call, bud, I said, reaching for the bottle of Everclear, the strongest vodka we had. Back at the bar in the city, we had some Polish vodka that would laugh in the face of good old Everclear. This was the best we had in small-town America. It wasn't the most popular, as the majority of our patrons weren't looking to say bye-bye to their motor functions as quickly as this maybe 115-pound soaking wet kid seemed to be, but he asked for it. Five shots again? I asked, brandishing the bottle like Excalibur before him. How much for the bottle? Even with the jacked-up prices this hole-in-the-wall charged, he could easily afford the bottle, the five shots he'd already put away, and still have enough left over to call a taxi, if it could even speak by the time his binging came to a close. After he filled the small glass I offered him to the brim, tossed that back his gullet like nothing more than some freshly squeezed OJ, filled it back up and repeated the process, I grew more curious about what had him chasing after alcohol poisoning with such a passion. You might want to take it easy, kid. I said, hoping to avoid having to call an ambulance. 
He just glared back at me, not breaking his gaze from mine as he swallowed the third glass. It takes a lot to get me drunk, he said, still staring at me while filling the glass back up, his thumb hanging over the rim like a blind man hoping to avoid spilling his drink. What's your name, kid? I asked, uncertain of what else to say. Cora Bain. That's, uh, unusual. Yeah, I'm not from around here. He still wouldn't break his gaze from mine, nor would I from his. Even when he tipped his glass to his lips, his eyes remained fixed. While it almost felt like some childlike battle for dominance, there was something about this unsettlingly vacant stare that made me want to look away, like he was peering directly into my soul. So, uh, what's going on, kid? What's got you so... I'm not a kid. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that, I said, my fascination with the guy overruling my annoyance with his attitude. I don't mean to be patronizing. <sighs> I didn't mean to snap. Been a rough night, he said, finally cutting his gaze. Come on, what's going on, kid? Um, sir, you want to talk about it? Nope. My life is over. Nothing worth talking about. With a look in his eyes as he spoke, I could tell that he meant those words, or at least thought he did. Even with all the shit my folks put me through, I felt similarly when I heard about the accident that left my father dead and my mother clinging onto life in a hospital bed. I know it can feel that way sometimes, but I'm sure it's not as bad as you feel right now. Sometimes a friendly ear can help. Though I previously had no interest in hearing another sob story, I felt strangely consumed by the need to know what his deal was. It made no rational sense, other than the inherent bartender gut feeling, but something was, I don't know, wrong about this kid? You wouldn't believe me. Yeah, try me. He just waved me off, refilling his glass again and resuming his stare down with his fidgeting fingers. Losing my patience and interest in whatever he had going on, I just walked away from the guy, beginning the early stages of my cleaning up for the night. People had already begun to filter out, with the hour growing closer to closing time, leaving only a scattering of patrons here and there, and the odd, skinny guy still nursing his bottle. With only an hour or so to go, only a handful of drinks being served as I counted down the minutes, I rubbed my neck, moaning with the tension of the busier-than-usual day. Sure, it was nothing compared to an average shift in the city, but between my not being as young as I used to be and my currently aching shoulder, I was more than ready to just veg out for a bit. Oh shit, the skinny guy said, having climbed back to his feet, swaying from side to side. <sighs> you good? I asked with a sigh, hoping I wasn't going to have to help this idiot to the bathroom. Yep, he said, stabilizing himself with a hand on the bar. I'm just not used to this. Tolerance not quite as high as you thought, huh? <laughs> not in this thing, he said with a chuckle, patting his hand on his chest. I don't think your costume is going to affect your ability to hold your liquor. Costume, he said, turning his heavy eyelids to face me. That's one way to put it. Yeah? <laughs> and what would you call it? Damn meat suit is what it is. Meat suit? You didn't actually smear meat all over you, did you? No, you idiot, he said, making an almost offended expression. This fucking bag of flesh. Okay, I said, walking from behind the counter. Let me give you a hand, yeah? Unless you can get me out of this damn thing, ain't nothing you can do for me, he said, staggering towards the restroom. I just looked back at Jake, who seemed as puzzled as I was about this bizarre interaction, as did the table of woozy-looking college kids at one of the tables near the back. Shaking my head, I returned to my spot, resuming my rinsing out glasses. After about ten minutes or so, the guy came stumbling back to his stool, dropping to the floor when his inebriated aim couldn't quite guide his ass into the seat. I started to head around the counter again with another exhausted sigh, when a slander hand gripped the bar pulling his giggling owner back to his stool. <laughs> you good? <laughs> yep, the guy said with a giggle. I'm gonna call you a cab, I said, jumping from the sudden clap of thunder beyond the door. When I looked back to see the pale and somewhat afraid expression on the face of the kid, I felt my own back tense a little. I'm gonna hit the road before it gets too bad out there, Jake said, clapping a hand to my shoulder. You okay with closing up? Given that he lived a good 20 miles out while I was only 5 minutes from my home, I couldn't blame the guy. 
Sure, I was slightly annoyed by it, considering he hadn't lifted a finger to help me out the entire night, but there was nothing I wasn't used to. Yeah, I got it, I said, glancing to the few remaining customers, including the lone individual resting on the counter, still looking like he was almost shivering. As my boss headed out, most of the remaining guests followed him through the door, leaving me alone with the shuddering skinny kid in the bloodstained shirt. All right, kid, I said, choosing not to ask what had him so rattled. Looks like we're closing up early. I'll call you that cab and hang out with you until it gets here. Cool? Ain't no use, he said, still refusing to raise his head. <sighs> okay. Your choice, but you can't stay here. I... I ain't mean for any of this. Don't sweat it. Look, let me call you a cab, yeah? No, you don't understand, he said, pounding his fist on the counter. Cool it, kid. You had too much to drink, okay? Don't start. No! He's... he's coming. I'm not going anywhere. If you don't cool it, I'm calling the cops, you get me? I'll either leave, or calm the fuck down and let me call you a taxi. That's your only two options right now. You, uh... you still want to know what happened tonight? He said, his voice having reverted to a barely audible whisper. When the strobing blue lights passed by once more, I was momentarily distracted, gazing through the window. Turning back to see the kid filling up his glass again, I let out another heavy exhale. <sighs> Come on, kid, I whined. Enough already. They're looking for me, you know, he said, his words slurring slightly as he poured the next glass down his throat. They won't find me, though. <laughs> I'll be long gone by then. What did you do? I suddenly grew intimidated by the trembling young man, gazing more deeply at the crimson stains splashed across his clothing. The cops, earlier. Was that you? Wasn't supposed to be like this. Didn't expect to get stuck. Should have been long gone by now, but... I, I didn't know. Didn't know what? I was digging in my pocket for my phone, hoping that I could keep him distracted long enough while I inconspicuously dialed 911. He was still glaring at his glass, swirling around the liquid within. If I just dialed the number while urging him to confess his crime, it would be enough to get the police zeroed in on who they sought. Of course, if this went south, I may end up adding more stains to his shirt by the time they got here. What's your religious persuasion? He asked, looking me in the eye again, damn near causing my phone to slip from my fingers. Now, uh, why do you ask? That'd greatly affect how much you believe me, he said, knocking back the remains of his glass, reaching for the bottle once more. Heaven, hell, the man upstairs, and the other below. Come on, what's your outlook on the whole mess? Though the answer to that question was easy, I was not a believer. I had a feeling that was not what he wanted to hear. That being the question he chose to ask before I may learn his story, I had a feeling he may be no friend to the agnostics of the world. It was my father who initially swayed me from the church, as he was an avid believer. My mother was lukewarm on the topic, but she would play the part to appease him. They both stayed hopped up on pills most of the time, barely aware of my coming and going. It was that very addiction that left them both unemployed and in need of me working two jobs while trying to earn an education. They each had plenty of supposed ailments that warranted their precious prescriptions, whining and complaining about their debilitating aches and pains on those rare occasions when they would be moderately clear-minded. They wouldn't be fully doped up during those bi-weekly trips to the church, but they were far from clean. During my early years, those I have to squint my mind's eye to recall, my old man was the pastor of the same church they would drag me to over the years they were somewhat functional guardians. I was an avid sinner in my dad's eyes in need of correcting quite often. If nothing else, after a tumble down the steps of our front deck left him with a far less severe back injury than he claimed, his swiftly formed addiction left him far less able or motivated to beat my ass black and blue. He gave up preaching soon after, claiming his pain was far too brutal to allow him to stand in front of the room for hours at a time, but he would still be there first thing every Sunday morning and Wednesday night. While my mom wasn't quite as religious as her husband, she was always by his side, albeit begrudgingly, a fact of which she would drone on to me endlessly when we were alone. Honestly, they both talked shit about each other when their backs were turned, which was likely a factor in my mother developing a heart condition. 
While the doctors would claim that it wasn't particularly severe, she would swear that they didn't know what they were talking about. I suspect they prescribed her the drugs just to shut her up, as she and her husband were as regular at the hospital as they were at the church. After years of supporting them, taking the parental role to them that they never provided me, I grew to hate religion as much as I despised the two of them. Never really gave it much thought, I said, hoping this would be enough. Suppose a lot of folks are that way nowadays, he said, his hand trembling as he attempted to pour the final remnants of the bottle into his glass. When the hail began to pelt the window, interrupting the silence that followed his words, I once more let my phone slip from my hand. You don't gotta hide, friend, the guy said, glancing up at me from his glass. They won't make it in time, but you can try it. In time for what? He just smiled at me. A smile that appeared strangely inhuman and distorted. A smile that made me fear I may not make it home tonight after all. I ain't never done this before, you know, he said, cutting his gaze back to his bottle, trembling in his hand as he poured the last dregs into his glass. Thought it'd be simple enough. Just hop in, fuck some shit up, and bounce right back out again. But nope. Now I'm stuck here until he drags me back to the pit. Nothing I can do about that. He wasn't making the slightest bit of sense, assuring me that he was not of sound mind in the least. With any potential words I could offer frozen in my throat, silenced by the fear building within me, I can begin to fathom my next move. Think I'm nuts, <laughs> don't ya? He said with a chuckle. You ain't wrong, I suppose, but you ain't right either. Uh, how about I call you that cab, yeah? I said, my voice trembling almost uncontrollably. Maybe you can still be long gone before. There's nowhere I can run, he said, pounding his fist on the counter again. He'll find me no matter where I go. Ain't shit I can do about it. Let me help you, kid, I said, hoping to calm this lunatic down, at least to the point in which I may be able to escape with my life. Stop. Calling me, kid, he said through gritted teeth. Mollet called me the same damn thing, condescending prick. I ain't no fucking kid. Just got in over my head is all. Yeah, this guy's fucking nuts, I thought, trying to edge my way closer to where we kept the pistol stored under the bar. I hadn't run into the need to use it before, but it was one of the first things that Jake introduced me to when I began working here. He told me about a time or two he had pulled it from his holster, just to put the fear of God into a less than mellow drunk on occasion. After getting to know the guy more over the years, I learned to tell when his eyes were turning brown from one tail or another. Given the fact that he never shows the slightest motivation to help actually run the place, I highly doubted that he ever got his hands dirty in the past. Still, just knowing the gun was there was a bit of a safety blanket. On the rare occasion, a patron would get a little on edge. I'd never had a reason to pull it on anyone before. I had a bad feeling I'd be popping my cherry tonight. You see, the guy said, having returned to his pensive stare off with the glass, we don't come up to this plane much anymore. Not as often as folks think, anyway. Huh? I said, my entire being caught off guard by his words, before being able to prevent my tongue from flapping a response. What are you talking about? Back in the day, from what I've been told, the elders would pop up any time they wanted, taking control of all kinds of folks in lofty positions. But now, not so much. You know what it's like growing up here in those stories? I, uh, guess it's always hard to live up to expectations, I said, playing along with his delusions, hoping I could keep things calm until I could figure out a way out of this. You have no idea. I mean, I ain't no kid, you know. But I'm older than I look, and this thing, he said, patting his chest again. Still, I would have loved to be around during those golden years Moloch told me about. Ever since Lucifer turned over a new leaf or whatever, hell just ain't no fun anymore. It was long before my time, though. I barely even registered what he was saying at first, still trying to hide my attempts to both call the law and reach the revolver. When he dropped that little slice of madness, I instantly grew aware of how far gone this guy really was. 
if he truly believed what he was claiming, something I was not about to let sink in at the time. I knew there would be no talking him down if he lost his cool. When the clamping thunder grew so loud that it seemed to shudder the entire building, causing me to jump like a frightened child again, the guy just let out a heavy sigh. They ain't got much time left now, he said, rubbing his temples. Look, I said, my voice trembling as much as the floor. How about I give you a ride, huh? I can take you back to your house, or ain't nowhere I can hide. Have you been listening? He is coming, and he don't tolerate demons that cross the line anymore. Um, I, uh, the, there are always options, kid. I, I know that. Stop calling me a fucking kid, he shouted, pounding the bar so hard that the surface split down the center. I just stood there, frozen in place, barely able to form a coherent thought. The look in his suddenly darkened eyes made me realize that he may not be delusional after all. That the sinister gaze, glaring through my unblinking eyes, may not be human after all. Not by a long shot. I'm not a child, he said, almost whisperingly, a melancholy look taking the place of that rage-fueled expression. I wanted to say something, anything, in an attempt to figure out a way out of this, but all I could fathom at the time was my blood joining the dried crimson stains on his shirt. I'd always dreamt of coming up here and sending that fear of hell back into this damned world. But I never actually entertained doing it, you know. It wasn't until Moloch found me, talking about reigniting the old ways, that I even started to consider it. When he fixed his gaze back on his drink again, I finally convinced my fingers to listen to my fracturing mind. I whipped the phone from my pocket, dialing the three digits I could, only hope would lead to my salvation. So I muted the speakers as to not alert my captor to my actions, regardless of the fact that he assured me I was welcome to make the call. The soft chuckle he made assured me that he knew damn well what I was doing. He didn't call me out on it, nor did he threaten me in any way. He just shook his head before beginning to speak again. Moloch didn't come out and tell me to do this, you know. He just told me all about some of his experience with possession, and how easy and natural it felt. He did kind of explain how to do it, and how to sneak through the walls into this world, but I made the decision to do it myself. I suppose I wanted to make him proud, to show him I was worthy, or whatever. Please, I said, speaking a little louder than I had been in hopes of conveying to those on the other end of the phone how dire my situation was. I'll give you whatever you want. Just let me go. Don't hurt me. He just <laughs> chuckled and shook his head again, letting out another heavy exhale. He didn't respond to my words, nor did he so much as acknowledge them, aside from his exhausted sigh. Only continued his bizarre story. When I ended up in this little shithole of a town, I jumped into the first meat bag I came across. Like Moloch had said, it was easy as pulling on a fresh pair of pants. The rain and hail grew even more intense, the wind practically cracking the windows from the pressure outside. I could hear the glass straining from it, while the door rattled so hard, I just knew it would burst open any second. The guy in the bloodstained shirt glanced over to the tremoring entrance, his lower lip quivering ever so slightly. He closed his eyes, knocking back the last dregs of his drink. Give me another drink, will ya? The stronger, the better. I just pulled the first bottle I saw, paying little attention to what it was, laying it gently before him. Much obliged, he said with a nod, filling his glass, knocking it back, and filling it again. Might as well enjoy it while I can. The, um, the police are on their way, I said in an almost embarrassed tone, almost feeling ashamed with how pitiful he looked all of a sudden. Yep, he said with another nod. You can still make a run for it. When I took this scrawny little shit, he said, ignoring my words again. I can't even explain how it felt. Well, not in a way you'd understand. It was... I mean, I'd never felt this kind of power before. In hell, I'm just an average asshole, you know? Nothing special. But in this, I felt like a fucking god. Just couldn't help myself. Couldn't resist it. What did you do? 
Again, the words slipped my lips before I could stop them, feeling both intrigued and absolutely terrified at the same time. I killed him. Snuffed him out as easily as if I was taking a piss. Even if I only recently learned how to do that part, <laughs> he said, gesturing to the restroom with the tilt of his head. Everyone in that damn gas station I hopped into. The damn gut spilled out with a flick of my wrist. It was... intoxicating. Jesus fucking... Hey, watch your language, <laughs> he said, laughing again before tipping the bottle to his lips. The problem, though, when I came down from that initial high, I realized that it would be in a shit ton of trouble if I didn't vacate the area right then and there. If I could have escaped, leaving this asshole to take the heat, I no would have been any the wiser. Turns out, though, getting out of this meat suit ain't nowhere as easy as getting into it. I got stuck. I got scared. Panicked and ran, all the while still trying to break out. By the time it finally dawned on me that I have no choice but to face what's coming to me, Found myself standing right outside this bar. Figured I might as well experience getting good and fucked up before the end of the road. The door finally gave way, ferocious wind, hail, and rain blasting in from the outside. I whipped my head to the side, startled by the tables being caught in the veritable hurricane, tumbling across the floor. The fear ramped up to the next level with the knowledge that I was between the hell between these walls and beyond. It wasn't just my mortality that scared me so much, not the terror of sharing the chaos-filled room with an actual demon from the pits of hell, nor the escalating storm that may tear this building to its foundation. My whole life, I had never believed in heaven or hell, gods and devils, or angels and demons. If this guy was what he claimed, then I had no doubt that I may indeed be accompanying him on his journey back home. The accident that claimed the life of my parents was due to the brakes failing on their old caddy vehicle that I was charged with maintaining over the years, just like any other responsibility they shunned. I was miserable and bitter back then, hating them both as well as their ever-growing list of needs and demands. When I had to perform the brake job, only days before that ill-fated drive left them in ruins at the base of that mountain, I can't deny that part of me hoped for that very outcome. It was my fault my father died that day that my mother suffered for weeks until she faded away in that hospital bed. My hands that led them to death's door. My actions that damned me. The thing is, my lone customer said almost directly into my ear, causing me to spin in place to see him standing right in front of me. Even though I knew I was fucked, I still wanted more. More blood. More suffering more death. I backed away from him as he paced closer, fumbling my hands beneath the counter, praying to everything I had never before held holy that I could reach the revolver in time. I only got seconds of best, he said, an unnaturally wide grin almost splitting his face in two. It's kind of a damned if I don't and damned if I do sort of thing. Might as well enjoy one more for the road. What do you think about that, kid? The windows blew apart, raining glass across my back and the shuddering counter. Bottles and glasses shattered beside me, while the eyes glaring into mine darkened even more than they had before. I could see his lips moving, but I couldn't make out a single word through the chaos around me, shaking and cracking the walls of the place. As he lunged, I thrust my foot into his gut, causing him to lose his footing and drop to the shuddering floor. I jumped for the gun, yanked it from the holster and fired three rounds into his chest before he could even get back to his feet. To my horror, this only made him laugh, with blood streaming from his chest and mouth. As I tried to leap across the counter, I felt his tight grip around my shoulders, yanking me back before he tossed me to the ground as though I was light as a fucking pillow. He just stood there, glaring down at me, his mouth drooling crimson like a rabid sasquatch. As he outstretched his hand, his eyes widening with manic fury. A blinding stab of lightning accompanied the violent boom of thunder paralyzing my every sense as I screamed in madness against the violent end. I was still screaming while everything fell silent around me. I just knew that I was dead, falling weightlessly through the fabric of reality, descending to the fiery pit in which I would spend eternity in torment. 
when I hesitantly blinked my eyes back open after coming to the realization that I was not only not falling, but sitting, that I once more found myself unable to fathom the reality I looked upon. All right, mate, the well-dressed man with his blonde hair tied back into a ponytail said. Whether it was him I took note of first, or the fact that not only was the bar not in ruins, but the storm outside, the unbroken windows, had fallen silent and still. The slender man, wearing a pinstriped gray vest, black tie, and white shirt with the sleeves rolled up, seemed to be studying me with a strange look of concern. When I glanced to his side to see the guy who had exposed me to the most batshit crazy night of my life, slumped over the bar, seemingly sleeping it off, I once more found my words trapped in my throat. What? He's gone. Well, you know, gone from inside him, anyway, the stranger said with a shrug, as though this were a completely average event. Who? I stuttered, though I feared I was well aware of the answer. It's not important, he said, fishing a pack of cigarettes from his pocket, raising his eyebrows as if to ask if this was acceptable. He was fished the ashtray from beneath the counter that Jake would often utilize on those rare occasions he would stick around until closing time. Cheers, mate, the man said, lighting up the tip of his smoke, offering me the pack and lighter. I just slowly shook my head, not breaking my eyes from his alarmingly kind face. He just gave me a wink with the click of his tongue in that very British way. It wasn't until that gesture that I took note of his accent, though I highly doubted he was indeed just some random limey in a nicely tailored suit vest. What What happened to him? I asked, my voice still barely breaking a whisper. He will answer for the lives he took this night, he said, taking a deep drag from his cigarette. Though I'm well aware he was, well, encouraged to do this. Being a gullible fool is no excuse for his actions. He, um, he, he talked about, uh, the, um, Moloch? The man just nodded with a deep and pensive stare something that gave me a glimpse of the far older being that hid behind the more youthful face. It was at that moment when the reality of whom I looked upon sank in, inspiring my limbs to begin trembling once again. I arranged for, well, let's call it a shell or a husk, for Corabane to dwell within for a time, to serve the mortal sentence for his crimes. He cannot escape this vessel, nor can he reach his natural abilities, while locked inside. It will age and weaken, just like any human body, while he lives out the remainder of his mortal years behind bars. Once his time on this plane is done, well, I'll see how much he has learned from this experience, and we'll go from there. I, um, I already called the police. They, they should... Don't worry, mate. We'll take him care of, he said with a crooked and somewhat mischievous smile. The authorities were redirected to the man for whom they sought. Justice, I assure you, will be served, my friend. What about Moloch? I, I mean, if, if he was pulling the strings or whatever, what Moloch, he said with a disturbingly hateful tone, will account for his actions soon enough. There is no need for you to concern yourself with this matter any further. As his momentarily furrowed brow let loose again, he gave me another crooked smile, raising the cigarette back to his lips. We sat in silence for a time while their recently vacated kid slumped over the counter and began to stir. It wasn't until then that I noticed that his shirt was no longer stained with that crusted crimson spray, nor the holes left in the wake of the bullets I fired into him. I glanced back from the sleeping young man to the bright eyes of the ponytailed stranger, suddenly growing more intimidated by his reason for lingering, if his business was truly finished here. Don't suppose I could trouble you for a pint? he said, giving me something resembling an apologetic look. Without a second thought, I grabbed him a clean glass and filled it to the brim, hoping my absent-minded selection of lager would be to his liking. Thanks, mate, he said, pulling a twenty from his vest pocket, to which I shook my head. Uh, on the house. You're the governor, he said, with another tongue-click wink. While he took a long drink from his glass, I poured myself a beer, not to necessarily join him in a drink, but to enjoy what I had to assume to be my last before facing justice for my own crimes. It honestly surprised me the longer I shared his company how quickly I came to peace with what was surely to come. Yes, though I never actually believed in where I was likely headed before the sun would rise, I was still well aware of the reputation of the place, that my endless torment had only just begun. Still, 
in many ways, finally accounting for the premature death of my parents made me feel so much more lighter in a bizarre kind of way. It wasn't your fault, the man said, breaking the strangely comforting silence. He snuffed out the butt of his smoke in the ashtray, pulled another from his pack, not allowing his eyes to meet mine, as he focused on the task at hand. I just sat there, my mind spinning in circles, both with the crazy events of the night and what he was insinuating, what this man of all people was insinuating. You were working, what, two jobs, yeah? I just gazed at him while he glanced back at me, my jaw dropping slightly. You were a kid, Samuel. An exhausted, overworked, and taken for granted child. Your parents took advantage of your kindness while pushing aside your needs in favor of their own. My heart was racing so much that my head was growing more loopy by the second. Was this a trick? Did he want to build within me a shadow of hope before snatching it away from me? The brakes didn't fail, mate. But, no, no, they did. I, I mean, that's what the report said. And how accurate can any report be on a car in that sort of shape, crumpled like a crisp bag at the bottom of a hill? No. No, I fucked up. When I was changing them, all, all I could think about was how tired I was of their shit. At that moment, I, I, I wanted them gone. I made it happen. It's my fault. It's not, Samuel. Even with the chaos they fueled in your mind and heart, you followed every instruction to the letter. Even with your exhaustion and fractured emotions, you performed that brake job as well as any trained mechanic. It was a blowout that caused your father to lose control of the vehicle. All that combined with his reflex being greatly lessened by his precious pills. But I, I, I wish them dead, I said, tears streaming down my face. I was cursing them and everything they put me through with every turn of their wretched. I wanted them gone. I wanted to be free. Trust me, mate, he said, reaching his hand across the counter, wrapping his fingers around my trembling shoulder. Everyone, at one point or another, no matter how much they have going for them, has wished their parents dead at one time or another. If that alone was all it took, every child would be an orphan. The warm touch of his hand almost calmed my racing pulse. I once more looked into his kind eyes, sniffling from the slowly dissipating flow of tears. For minutes, we looked upon one another this way, until he gave me another smirk, gently pulled his hand from my shoulder, and chugged down the remains of his beer. Well, I believe I should be going, he said, taking one final deep inhale of nicotine before smearing his cigarette next to the other. He got to his feet, slowly making his way to the door. As he reached for the exit, he turned back to face me one last time. It's time to forgive yourself, mate. I still just glared at him, sniffing back the tears. After all, there was nothing to forgive in the first place. As he pushed open the door, the cool night breeze blowing in from outside, he stopped again, just halfway glancing back over his shoulder. One last piece of advice before I go. He said, that smirk still visible through the shadows. Leave the married women alone, yeah? The next bullet from a pissed-off husband might just hit his mark. With that, he walked out, the door closing shut behind him. I still just stood there, my heart thundering as hard as the storm had what felt like hours ago. Slowly, my shaky legs lowered me back to my stool while I chugged down the rest of my beer in an attempt to wrap my mind around everything. When I finally got control of my extremities again, I watched out the two glasses as the kid slumped on the counter began to raise his head. Uh, what happened? <laughs> yeah, I think you might have had a bit too much to drink, I said with a laugh, fishing a bottle of water from the fridge. How about you get hydrated and I'll give you a ride back home? Over the weeks that followed that Halloween night, Though I was still haunted by the reality of things I never believed in, I felt more alive than I think I ever had before. Though I can still clearly recall the events of that crazy night, I can't remember the face of the stranger who saved both my life and my sanity. I remember the conversation we had and the guilt he relieved me of, as well as the final piece of advice he shared. But that's it. As deeply as I gazed into his strangely warm and friendly eyes, I can't as much as recall what color they were, 
or any of his features. Melvin Child, a young man in his early 20s, was arrested for the murder of seven people at a nearby gas station that October 31st. The video footage showed him stabbing the victims with a long kitchen knife. Though he was quite small and slender, he outmaneuvered those attempting to fight back, fleeing the scene of the crime moments later. Though the district attorney would not entertain his claims of being a demon trapped in a false human shell, seeing this as an attempt to secure an insanity plea, he had to go through the motions. Ultimately, his claims were tossed out as ineffective if somewhat exaggerated performance, and he earned seven life sentences for his crimes, one for each victim. The town mourned the loss of the lives taken by that madman, but even those close to the victims have found a way to move on with their lives after a time. Though I didn't personally know any of those unfortunate souls, other than perhaps a passing glance at the bar on occasion, my heart breaks for their families. My life, or my outlook on it, has changed dramatically over this past year. Though my stiff and achy shoulder will always be a reminder of lines I don't need to cross anymore, it doesn't seem quite as painful as it used to. Perhaps it was my guilt that drove me into the arms of the women I had no business in messing around with, as there is no future or commitment in such relationships, things of which I believed myself to be unworthy back then. Maybe I wanted some pissed off husband to finish me off in hopes of paying the cost I thought I owed to fate. That's not who I am anymore. I met a truly amazing woman a few months back, someone else who has altered my perception of the joy and wonder in life. I'll be spending this Halloween with her, rather than the extravagantly costumed drunken patrons of the second most popular bar in town. Jake wasn't happy about it when I told him I'll be skipping this one. Eh, he'll get over it. For me, this season now means more than just a time of year to watch other people enjoy themselves. Though I always enjoy this time of year, finding a fraction of the happiness that always eluded me and the laughter of others, it has taken on a whole new meaning now. For me, Halloween will always be the anniversary of when I finally let go of the burdens I had carried my whole life. The night I both almost died and learned to live again.